Hey, good morning, everybody. Like Sister Everett said, my name is Gino Allison, and I want to welcome you all to the South Suburban Vineyard Church. Special welcome to those of you who might be visiting with us for the very first time. So glad to have you with us. I'm here. I'm glad to see everybody, by the way. And I'm also happy to see those of you who are rocking with us on the live stream. It's good to see. Uh, I guess I don't see you. You see me. Uh, good to have you here with us, especially those of you who might listen later on demand. Thank you for being with us. Hey, I want to just also say, uh, I've really been enjoying this Pastor Appreciation Month. One we could stretch it out a little bit. Uh, but I just want to say thank you for all the cards and emails. Somebody brought me a pie this week. So I, we are feeling the love as the pastoral team here. And so we uh, want you to know that we feel honored and blessed to serve in this community. Well, let me get into the word this morning. Um, as ever mentioned, I'm continuing a teaching series that we've simply been calling Death dying in the end. And I believe it's safe to say that my disposition toward death has evolved a bit over the course of my uh, four decades on this earth. Uh, my earliest memories of death and things surrounding mortality and things like that, I uh, have faint memories as a young child. And a lot of those early memories, memories center around sort of the death of my parents' friends. And my earliest memories have me walking down this long hallway from my room early in the morning into the kitchen where I would find my parents there earlier than they would normally be up. And you ever know, you walk into a room and there's sadness in the room. And my parents, I would look at them, maybe somebody's eyes would be at water. I said, Mommy, Daddy, what's the, what's the matter? And they would say, well, Bill died. Um, a lot of my parents' friends were from the streets, and so we, we rarely knew anybody's real name. They would say, Fluky died today. <laughs> or Man Man got shot, or Pookie, or somebody was, was, was killed, and there was just this, this sadness in the room. I have faint memories of my grandmother, my father's mother. We would get dropped off there early in the morning. I have early memories of, uh, of, uh, of my grandmother. And I remember the morning when I walked into the kitchen in the, in the scenario that I just described, and they said, Mama died today. And so this would continue all throughout my life. But what I would say is it wasn't until my late 20s that I lost somebody close to me. And so my experience with death as a preacher's kid, we were at a lot of funerals. My father would officiate a lot of ceremonies, but death never came close to me until uh, I was 27 or 28. One year into our church plant here, we'd moved back here from Champaign-Urbana, and in that year, my father passed away. See, my father had gotten sick, complications from diabetes, and his health was declining. Uh, toward the end of my days in college, but I honestly, honestly didn't occur to me that my father would die. And I know that sounds crazy because we know that people die, but in my mind, I didn't entertain the idea that my father would die. And in case you haven't put it together, that those pictures of me and my father. And he was a giant in my eyes larger than life. And if you were wondering, yes, his name is embroidered on his shirt, and I am wearing a name tag that says Lil Gino. Not Little Gino, but Lil Gino, L-I-L. And my father worked at a uniform store that serviced, you know, bus drivers and police officers, and he just embroidered his name on his shirt because he could. He got his little name tags because I guess they were free for him. But that was and still is my hero larger than life to me, and it's beyond me how he became such a great father with no models. Didn't know his dad, and yet this man walked on water in my eyes, and so his death to me was devastating. Deep sadness enveloped me. I didn't get angry at God. I didn't get mad at God. I don't even be, remember being mad at the situation but death came close to me in a way that it had never visited me before. And at the moment my father passed, I recognized within myself that I responded differently to death, particularly death around me. My father's death tenderized my heart in a way that I wasn't prepared for initially. That is to say that just watching death on TV 
watching a scene of a funeral and grieving people, so certainly being around it, I would just begin to enter into that pain like it was my own. Experiencing that deep sadness, the searing loss of someone close to you has changed my life. And although uh, I cry more than I, I'm comfortable with these days, I think it's made me a better friend. I think it's made me a better pastor. I, I think it allows me to sit in that pain, that awkwardness that death brings and show up better. Death has changed me. No doubt, as you have your various brushes with death and your own mortality and the mortality of others around you, that it's changed you too, which is why it's fitting and it's important to have a teaching series called Death, Dying, and the End. And as I've listened to the first faithful installments of this series, it comes to no surprise that we've all been touched by the reality of death. As I listen to these three powerful sisters who have pastored us so well on such a uh, challenging subject, I've come to believe further that this is a necessary conversation, one that has been, in my opinion, well overdue. Shannon opened this series talking about the importance of dying well, and she made the point really well that the way to die well is to what? Is to live well. Lauren continued by talking to us about the death of death, which is how Christ, through the resurrection, takes the sting out of death, and the way that we approach death with the certainty of heaven and a blessed assurance and a hopefulness, she said that Jesus is the key to that. Last week, our dear sister Renee did such a fantastic job of talking to us about uh, how the scriptures give us permission to grieve, and not just permission to grieve, but the assurance of comfort that grief is okay that Jesus in heaven can handle our grief, even our deepest grief. And she also told us that there is a unique blessedness and a unique comfort that only comes to us as we enter into the blessed disposition of mourning. And this morning, I want to continue this series by talking a bit about the end. The end of time as we know it, and I'm talking about Christ's second coming. In case you hadn't figured this out, in case nobody ever told you, friends, the king is coming back. Now, I have a com confession to make as I try to do this subject, this vast subject, justice. I am slightly uncomfortable with how uncertain I am about the specific sequence and all of the details regarding Christ's second coming. I'm a little bit uncomfortable about how, how uncertain I am as I try to synthesize all of the dispositions and all of the theories, I come up usually more confused. I'm even more uncomfortable at times, especially as a preacher, by how little, how little I care at times about all the particulars surrounding the various end-time views. But I'm increasingly leaning on what I do know, and that is Christ will return someday and that he is coming back. He will be back. Now, as I was processing this message this morning, I thought about the old movie, The Terminator. Anybody seen this movie, The Terminator? This movie was the stuff back in the day. Arnold Schwarzenegger, so cool. This is The Terminator, right? And can anybody remember sort of the famous line from these Terminator movies? Anybody? I'll be back, right? And who among us hasn't said in that unique accent, I'll be back, right? But it's been so long since I watched the film that I had to kind of go back on YouTube and find the clip of when he said this so I could figure out who he was talking to and what was the context for, for, for such an iconic movie line. Well, when I got on YouTube, I discovered there's like four or five Terminator movies. I don't know. The other ones must not have been that good because I didn't really hear about them. Well, there's a, there's a whole collection of these movies, and wouldn't you know it, that some variation of this line shows up in all four or five of the movies. What's more interesting is that this line is said to different people and in different contexts, and who the person was speaking to that said this line, 
who it landed on or their closeness or relationship with this determined the meaning of this phrase. For example, in the first movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger shows up to the police station. He's looking for this woman. The guy's kind of blowing him off, and he says to the guy for the very first time, I'll be back. And moments later, he comes crashing through the police station doors, bursts through the place, and shoots up everybody. That wasn't a good I'll be back, right? That was the bad one. But as you look at how this, this line plays out in the rest of the movie, sometimes he says it to the people that he loves, to the people he likes, the people who he's supposed to protect. And that same line lands differently on different people depending on their relationship to the Terminator. Now, I don't want to at all liken Jesus to the Terminator. That is like not my connection. But what I'm saying is when Jesus says he'll be back, or when I say he's coming back, that line lands differently depending on your proximity to Jesus. That line might land on you differently depending on your affinity to God and the things of God. Am I making sense? To those who have been patiently awaiting the coming of Christ, carefully curating their life so that it's pleasing to him, that line lands like a cool glass of water on a hot summer day. The king is coming back. But to those who are far from them, to those who are doing their own thing, to those swimming, wallowing in spiritual indifference, opposition to God, that line lands, friends, very very differently. I'll confess to say that this discussion surrounding the end times and Christ's return are far deeper and far wider than I can understand. They are far deeper and far wider and far more nuanced than I will even begin to scratch the surface today. And if you're familiar with the four major views concerning the end times, whether it's amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, which seems to be the prevailing view, or dispensationalism, and you can look those things up in your spare time. As you start to research these, these things, you'll find that these viewpoints disagree widely on a lot of the points. If you've beheld some of these discussions, if you've read any of the books, if you put the information side by side, there is vast and strong disagreement about the same passages of Scripture. But the beautiful thing, the sweet thing, is that there is also sweet agreement and a common hope from at least one point that we all agree about despite where you land on the spectrum. And that common piece of agreement is that Christ is our only hope and that he is coming back. The common point of agreement is that Christ is our only hope and that he is coming back. And so in that vein, I want to continue this teaching series with a message I'm simply calling, He'll Be back. He'll be back. Take note of how that lands on you, how that fact about who Jesus is and what Jesus will do. Take note uh, about how it lands on your heart in this moment, because that's going to be important as we continue. He'll be back. I'm going to be in a passage of Scripture this morning, at least start in a passage of Scripture this morning, John chapter 11. Would you meet me there in your Bibles this morning? John chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 14, excuse me. And while you find that, let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to bring your word this morning, for our opportunity to lead this congregation, lead this collection of believers who have gathered to worship you and to drink deep, Lord, of all that you'll provide this morning. Father, as always, I pray that you would put power on these words. Move me out of the way so that I'm not an obstruction, an obstruction to what you want to plate for these folks this morning. May the book come alive to us. It may a challenging, perhaps difficult, often avoided subject matter make sense to us today because of your spirit. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, amen. John chapter 14, I want to start at verse 1. And Jesus is talking to his disciples before his death. He's preparing him for the eventuality that he will go away. 
we read verse 1 in this way. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to, excuse me, and you know the way to where I'm going. Verse 5, no, we don't know, Lord, Thomas says. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had already, if you had really known me, you would know my Father. From now on, you do know, know him, and you have seen him. Now, Jesus says a lot in this short text, and even more in the remaining verses, which is why I want to assign it for you, the entire chapter uh, 14, as homework this morning. But to understand and appreciate this passage, particularly the short one that we read, we need to know what's happening in the preceding chapter. What's happened before we get to this faithful discourse this morning? The short answer is a whole lot. If you're familiar with John chapter 13, you know that a lot happens in that chapter. And to understand and to know what's happened in the previous chapter helps us to understand what's happening in the verses that we read. And so in this first uh, chapter, Jesus is sort of, he's washed the feet of the disciples. Many of you are familiar with that passage. And he lets them know yet again that he's going away. He's sitting at supper with his disciples and informs them that one of them, and we know Judas is the disciple that betrays Jesus, one of them is going to betray them. And an interesting thing happens when Jesus drops this bomb on them. They all start murmuring among themselves, asking one by one, is it me? And this is one of the most curious things in all of the scriptures, all of the, all of the disciples. When Jesus drops this on them, they wonder out loud, perhaps to each other, but to Jesus, is it me? And so Jesus has laid a lot on them, right? If that's not enough, in talking to his disciples, Peter promises that he's ready to die for Jesus, and Jesus says, Peter, slow down, my brother. In fact, it's true that you'll deny me three times before the rooster even crows in the morning. And so this is just what John records for us. No telling what he's left out. So a whole lot has happened, and we can bet, because we know the disciples, because we've interacted with them so much through the Gospels, that they are probably in distress. They are probably anxious. Their wheels are turning because Jesus had laid a whole lot on them. And so if that setting, where that is the context, we enter chapter 14, and Jesus says to them, fittingly so, don't let your hearts be troubled. I wonder if I could just pause here for a second and just say that those of you who come in today, and your context and your backdrop and the preceding moments and hours and days that brought you here, this particular sentence might bring unique comfort to you because you can take this to the bank today. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. He continues, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I'm going. Crystal clear, right? Wrong. In the very next verse, Thomas says, Jesus, and I'm paraphrasing, bro, we don't know what you're talking about. We are utterly confused. You're talking about going away, in many rooms someplace, Jesus, you don't have no house. And you're going to take us with us. What's more, you're proclaiming that we already know the way. Jesus, make it make sense to us. And it's true that in this time, particularly in this moment, and in many moments in passages of Scripture, the things that Jesus says can cause more questions than they provide answers. And on matters of consequence, like what's going to happen when Jesus comes back, or the fact that Jesus is actually coming back, and the eternal significance surrounding what happens when 
all this stuff is over, oh, we need these questions answered, don't we? And many of us feel like Thomas and the rest of the disciples, Jesus, tell us more. I know you can talk clearer than this. And so this passage and others like it raise questions about the coming of the Savior that I want to briefly unpack today and jog through. Four questions in particular. The first question that arises as we interact with texts like these is, why is Jesus coming back? Why is Jesus coming back? It's a really, excuse me, important question. Now, some of you want to pipe up because you're super jealous. He's coming back to judge the world. Well, you might not be wrong. Might I just say with all affection, settle down for a moment. Because many of us have been trained to see Jesus, especially we find ourselves on the right side of him. We, we've been trained to see Jesus come and get him, come straighten him out. Fix this mess. Bring your kingdom. And while you wouldn't be entirely wrong, I don't know if we should lead with that. Why is Jesus coming back? The simplest answer, the simplest answer you can give somebody is love. Maybe you haven't heard it recently, but Jesus loves you. I feel kind of responsible for how, uh, how, how um, little you might hear that out loud here. And I plan to fix it because I don't ever want you to be in doubt of this fact, Brother Eugene, Mama Berg, Sister Annie, that Jesus loves you a whole lot, and that is the driving force behind everything the Father does to, for, and toward us. That's not deep, but that's, that's news to some of you. Why is Jesus coming back? Because he loves you. Hebrews 9, chapter 29 says, and so Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, newsflash, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Listen, I love how that's played it. Because if you grew up with me, like, you grew up like me, they had us watching movies in the youth group called The Burning Hell. And their intention was to scare us toward Jesus. To boogeyman us toward Jesus. And we all went screaming toward him. Ah, I don't want to be left behind. Jesus, take me. Now, I'm grateful for a lot of that. <laughs> but it kind of messed me up. It, it kind of messed me up because... I don't know that, especially in those early years, that I was running into the arms of a loving Savior who was calling me unto himself, who had a beautiful plan for my life, so much as I was running from the devil. And whoever wrote Hebrews really put it into great words here. He will come again not to deal with our sins, primarily, but to bring salvation to all who eagerly wait for him. Notice the tone. Notice the framing. Love is why he came the first time. You don't believe me? John chapter 3, verse 16. For this is how God, what? Loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God has sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Love is why he first came. Love is also why he went away. John chapter 16, verse 7. But in fact, it is best for you, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the comforter. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin 
and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Listen, one of the things that the Spirit is going to do is to convict you, not condemn you, but to convict you of your sin, to point to the nature and character and goodness and truth of God so that you might know where the foul lines are in life, so that you might move through life with a trajectory toward life and godliness. This is one of the reasons why Jesus says, I must go. You need the comforter in order to stay on the right track. You need the comforter in order to, to live the good life. So love is why he came. Love is why he went. And love, friends, is why he was returning again. Again, check the framing. This is so important. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You hear the tenderness in that? You hear the pastoral warmth? In a statement like that, don't be troubled. I know I laid a whole lot on you, Peter. You over there sad. Guys still in the corner trying to figure out if they're the one that's going to. They're distressed. What was supposed to be good news to them landed on them like a ton of bricks. And here's Jesus with all of his comfort, all of his pastoral warmth. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. There's more than enough room where I'm going. And in fact, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when everything is ready, I will come and get you. Now, let me ask you, does that sound like an angry God to you? Does that sound like a God that is motivated by, let me see, let me catch it slipping. I'm going to come right after this sin so I can take more. <laughs> does that sound like a, a devious, unfeeling God? Or does that sound like a Savior who is motivated by love and the desire that love produces to be proximate to that which they love? Why is Jesus coming back? He's coming back because he loves us. And his goal is to gather us unto himself. However, there will be a clear distinction made between those who've surrendered their lives to Jesus and those who haven't. I feel like I need to say that because as we've avoided this subject of the end, not us on purpose, but Christians, and those who set the diet of preaching in our Christian institutions, it might be lost on you that while he's returning to grab those whom he loves and those who have lived with love and affection toward him and the things of God, that Jesus is very clear that in the end there will be two separate camps. Those who are on the Lord's side and those who are not. And where Jesus will come to the place that he's prepared for us, heaven and all the beauty and hopefulness and blissfulness of eternity with God, there is an alternative reality. There is a place that you don't want to be. Hell is real, folks. been many, many discussions about hell and like what that's really going to be like. Is it, is it eternal conscious torment? Is it really weeping and gnashing of teeth? Is it really, as it's described in scriptures, a lake of fire, an ongoing torment, or is it something lighter? I think Tim Keller said recently that, listen, don't talk yourself out of believing that the Bible is real and true about hell. If hell is nothing like what the Bible has described to us, he said you can only conclude that it's worse and not better. I was talking to my wife about this last night at dinner, and we were just turning this over, and we were talking about hell, and she said that the, the prospect, the prospect of never experiencing goodness again, whether there's fire or not, 
Even if you're on this earth and you're living far from the Lord, you can go to Starbucks and get happy. You can go to the rib shack and get glad for a minute. So whatever hell is really like, the, the prospect of never experience goodness, much less God's goodness, ever again, eternally separated from him, as my mama used to say, make you want to live right. Because there will come a day when Jesus, motivated by love, will come to judge the righteous and the unrighteous alike. This is the reality of what's going to happen when Jesus returns. That's why he's coming back, though. Another important question is, when is Jesus coming back? And the shortest answer I can give you is, I don't know. I want to also say that it's real easy to rock ourselves to sleep on this particular fact because they've been talking about Jesus coming back since the Bible days. When I was a kid, they, 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 they were preparing us that Jesus could like come back tonight. There are books written, seminars, in which people have, have picked dates, sold their stuff, Brought it to the church. Now, why the church needs it, if the world's ending, I don't know. But there have been dates. They said, on this date, and there was always this sort of urgency to it, and those dates come and go. And so it can sort of rock us to sleep, and we can lose the urgency. But I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but the Bible pushes us toward a state of readiness that we can't ignore. However, no one knows, Mark 13, 32, the day or the hour when these things are happening. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. So it's been kept for, from us. But the Scripture also tell us in Luke chapter 12, verse 40, you also must be what? Ready at all time, for the Son of Man will come when what? Least expected. Matthew 24, verse 24, you also must be ready at all times. The sun will come suddenly. Suddenly. You say, what's the message here, preacher? Be ready. Be ready. And get, get your kids ready. Don't be indifferent. Don't be apathetic. Don't let this fall out of your mind. When does he come? I don't know. Why isn't he here yet? I don't know. What should I do? Be ready. That's really all the scriptures give us. Be ready. The third question I see is, who is Jesus coming back for? I alluded to it earlier. Those who have put their trust in him. Is he coming back to the, for the perfect? No. I'm glad because I don't think I'd make it. And before you smile, you wouldn't make it either. He's coming back for those who have built their life on what Scripture calls the firm foundation that is Jesus. Don't let your hearts be troubled because Jesus tarries. Don't let your hearts be troubled because of the pain and grief that you experience in your everyday workaday life. But Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place for you when everything is ready. For those who have surrendered their life to Jesus, for those who have built their hope up on him, for those who have leaned the weight of their entire life on Jesus and his promise and the good news, Jesus says, I'm coming back for you. Again, the Hebrews text tells us that he's coming to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. And that begs the question, are you eagerly waiting? There are those of us who are eagerly waiting, and there are those who might say <laughs> with their heart and life and actions, I hope it's not today. I need about a week 
because I'm waiting for this honey to get back to me. I need some time because I'm in a little bit of a situationship right now, and I'm not ready for him now. I need some time because I'm in a space right now where I've asked God for some things, and he hasn't come through, and so I'm, I'm, not, even try, I'm not even really feeling him right now. He's coming back. I hope he's not coming right now because me and him, we're not on good terms. Or whatever you can fill in in that scenario, the point I'm getting at, if there's not an eager awaiting that is fueled by a state of readiness, and I'm talking to myself, There's not an eager awaiting for the return of Christ. That's kind of like a check engine light. Now, you can still drive the car, but get pulled over and, and get to a real mechanic to diagnose the thing. If my heart in this life and the next doesn't want to be near him, doesn't eagerly await his coming, doesn't make you a bad person, but it means something's off. It means something's not right. It means you need to tend to some things because God is sending his son back for those who are eagerly awaiting with ready expectation for the Savior's return. Fourth and final question, how is Christ coming back? How is Christ coming back? And Scripture gives us some some wild imagery, and too numerous for me to get into and unpack today, but I, I love this text in 1 Thessalonians. I love the picture it creates. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. And now, dear brothers and sisters, We want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet trumpet call of God, first the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Paul says, listen, he tells us this wild account of what's going to happen when Christ returns, and he urges us at the end, be encouraged. Don't be freaked out by this, and tell everybody who will listen to you. Don't be freaked out. Be encouraged by this, and use these words, this account of what will happen to encourage others as well. And so as we walk through this series and talking about death and dying in the end, many of us have been given a new paradigm for how to, to sit with death, particularly the death of those who knew Jesus. And Paul says, and we I often reference this text, at least the first verse of it, uh, at funerals, particularly uh, funerals of those who have died and gone to be with Jesus. We're sad, we miss them, but we know what their destination is, and so we grieve, not like the unbelievers do. We grieve not with despair, and we're not only left with the searing loss of not having this person with us again, but we know we'll see them again, and we also know that they are present with the Lord, at least their souls. And so it changes our disposition toward death. 
We grieve, yes, we've been given permission to grieve. There's a blessedness to grieve. There's a comfort that comes, but we don't grieve like those who are without hope because Christ shall return one day with a shout. And the dead in Christ, the scripture tells us, will rise first. And then the remaining with him. Does this make you glad? This is increase your anticipation for the Savior's return. And some of you say, no. Uh, that's honest. But that's check engine light. You better get to, 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 to Midas or, or some shade tree mechanic. Get somewhere. Because I would that when you read an account like this, your eyes begin to water, your breath gets short. You go, Lord, I ain't ready to go just yet, but if you come, let's do it. The prospect of my father in the arms of Jesus, it warms me. And I become the good kind of jealous to see his face again and be with the Savior. And it makes me want to live in a way so that when I hear an account like this or I hear news that the Savior is coming back for me, to get me, to get us, I say, Lord, hasten the day when my faith will be sight. Hasten the day. And so how should we respond to this? And worship team, you can make your way back. The simplest way and the most appropriate way I think we can respond to this is two words, with readiness and compassion. Readiness uh, and compassion. The readiness has to do with you. B because no, I can't prepare you. Like, you've got to prepare yourself. I can't get you ready to meet Jesus. Like, you've you got to get ready. And so readiness deals with your willingness to take these facts about Jesus coming back and let those facts convert your heart toward faith and that you would turn your heart toward God and the things of God. That you would examine yourself today and look around the room of your life and say, what is it that keeps me from being ready? What is it that when Jesus says, I'll be back, you say, I hope it's not now? What is that? Who is that? Why is that? The scripture tells us that if we lack wisdom on anything, especially something as consequential as this, the Lord is eager to provide an answer. But, James continues, if we ask, we must believe and not doubt. In other words, we must take what the Spirit says to us and act on it so that we might be ready. And I don't know, I just expected in a room this size that there are any number of people here or watching that would say with honesty, God, I'm not ready. I don't feel eager about this news. I see my check engine, check heart light bleaking at me, and Lord... I got some work to do. I want to be ready. The other side of this coin is compassion. And the compassionate side of the coin involves others. Paul says in the first Thessalonian text, take these words in, be encouraged by them, and tell anybody and everybody who will listen. The truth is, Christ is coming back. And we know a whole lot of people who haven't surrendered their life to Jesus. We know a whole lot of people who perhaps haven't even heard a thorough presentation of the gospel. Explained to them by somebody who knows, who somebody believes, and somebody whose life they trust.
And so our response to this, particularly if we're feeling confident and ready, is to tell somebody. Is to tell somebody. And I'm going to say this, and I'm already over my time. I'm going to say this. We live in a current culture and climate well, we have just been socialized to not, like, want to, 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 to impose our faith on somebody else. And there's a measure of that that is respectable, and there's a measure of that that is good. But if you saw a, 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 a vehicle slowly, I mean slowly heading for a cliff, I know many of you well enough to go, well, you wouldn't say, well, none of my business. Who am I? Who am I to hop on there and stop it? Who am I not to warn these people that the cliff is feet away? Like, I know you well enough to know that that would not be your disposition, but we're talking about eternity with Jesus or eternity, the worst possible reality that you can imagine. Eternally removed from any measure of goodness, especially God's goodness, um, I think we might want to tell somebody. I think we want to get our kids ready. Uh, Who am I to force my kid to go to church if they don't want to? They got to decide. They got to go to school. They got to do their chores. Is that more consequential than eternity? I don't care if they sit back here with their arms folded. Get them in here. And tell somebody. That's how we respond. He'll be back. Hasten the day, Lord, when our faith should be set. My time's up. Let me pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for shaking us this morning, comforting others, and reminding us that this is a matter that we should take seriously. Come, Holy Spirit, may we build our lives upon you, the firm foundation that is Christ, and may we be ready when you come back. Give us the boldness and courage to share this good news with anyone who will listen. As we continue to worship you today, Father.